This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We pray together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord.
God dwells in you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the hand of Moses, your servant, you led your people out of slavery and made them free at last. Grant that your church, following the example of your prophet Martin Luther King, may resist oppression in the name of your love and may secure for all your children the blessed liberty of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson is a reading from the book of Exodus. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them, now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The reading is an excerpt from Martin Luther King Jr.'s acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize in December of 1964 in Oslo, Norway. At a moment when 22 million Negroes of the United States of America are engaged in a creative battle to end the long night of racial injustice, I accept this award on behalf of a civil rights movement which is moving with determination and a majestic scorn for risk and danger to establish a reign of freedom and a rule of justice. I am mindful that only yesterday in Birmingham, Alabama, our children crying out for brotherhood were answered with fire hoses, snarling dogs, and even death. I am mindful that only yesterday in Philadelphia, Mississippi, young people seeking to secure the right to vote were brutalized and murdered. And only yesterday, more than 40 houses of worship in the state of Mississippi alone were bombed or burned because they offered a sanctuary to those who could not accept segregation. After contemplation, I conclude that this award is a profound recognition that nonviolence is the answer to the crucial political and moral question of our time, the need for man to overcome oppression and violence without resorting to violence and oppression. Civilization and violence are antithetical concepts. Negroes of the United States have demonstrated that nonviolence is not sterile passivity but a powerful moral force which makes for social transformation. Sooner or later, all the people of the world will have to discover a way to live together in peace and thereby transform this pending cosmic elegy into a creative psalm of brotherhood. If this is to be achieved, man must evolve for all human conflict a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. I refuse to accept despair as the final response to the ambiguities of history. I refuse to accept the cynical notion that nation after nation must spiral down a militaristic stairway into the hell of thermonuclear destruction. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. This is why right, temporarily defeated, 
is stronger than evil triumphant. I have the audacity to believe that people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, equality and freedom for their spirits. I believe that what self-centered men have torn down, other centered men can build up. And the lion and the lamb shall lie down together, and every man shall sit under his own vine and fig tree, and none shall be afraid. I still believe that we shall overcome. This faith can give us courage to face the uncertainties of the future. It will give our tired feet new strength as we continue our forward stride toward the city of freedom. When our days become dreary with low hovering clouds and our nights become darker than a thousand midnights, we will know that we are living in the creative turmoil of a genuine civilization struggling to be born. Here ends the reading.
good news of Jesus according to Luke. Jesus said, I say to you that listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do unto you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. The Gospel of the Savior. In the name of the unrelenting love of God, Amen. Wow, what a gospel reading. Jesus' words are challenging, confusing, and vexing, but these words are at the heart of his teaching. It is the inverted logic of the kingdom of God, or what most people would refer to as crazy talk. I mean, where else are you invited to love your enemy? Do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and more. Pretty much nowhere. Why? Because it makes no earthly sense. Jesus boldly declared a kingdom that is in almost every way different from the kingdoms of this world. Kingdoms that encourage you to look out for number one. We were taught and we learned by example that you love those who love you and hate those who hate you. That life is always a game of quid pro quo. We grasp onto the easy fluency of revenge, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This appetite for payback prompted Gandhi's famous quote, an eye for an eye, and soon the whole world goes blind. When we have been wronged, it is easy to fantasize about what we might do or say, but then we hear Jesus teaching don't treat them as badly as they treat you. Bless them. Pray for them. Do good to them. When we act out of such a radical place of love, there are no guarantees that the other person will be changed. But you will be. Your heart will be changed. Walter Brueggemann comments on this passage. Jesus' teaching is not a scolding. And it's not a little romantic lesson in feeling good about everybody and acting silly. It's a rather rich evangelical statement that there is more to life than our capacity to contain it in all our little moral categories, whereby life is reduced to a simple set of black, white, yes, no moral choices. For, says Jesus, if you reduce your life to the simple practice of loving your friends and hating your enemies, of being generous only to those you like and trust, and resistant wherever there is risk, what's the big deal? Anybody can do that. Any thief, sinner, deal cutter, anybody who can count and remember and keep score can do that. But you, says Jesus, are not part of that pitiful bunch of frightened people. You know more and you know differently. And you have freedom to act differently. You know about the larger purposes of God and you are called to act concretely as though the purposes of God really did make a difference in your life. 
Did you get that? We are called to act concretely as though the purposes of God really do make a difference in our lives. As a church, we must firmly hold that we are called to act concretely as though the purposes of God really do make a difference in our communal life. Just to be clear, this radical love does not call us to be silent in the face of injustice. It calls us to love those with whom we strongly disagree. Nelson Mandela spoke inconvenient truth to the powers that held South Africa in the grip of racism. That boldness landed him in prison for 27 years. When freed, he continued his quest to end racism, not through violence, but through pursuing relationship. He called it truth and reconciliation. It was a revolution of communication and forgiveness, and apartheid fell to its knees. Martin Luther King Jr. pursued civil rights through nonviolent means, yet he called for total commitment to kingdom values. He was openly frustrated by white Christians who proclaimed a love of justice, yet hesitated in following through in action. Of these, he said, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's greatest stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. Jesus, the one who asks us to love our enemies, was all in when it came to social change and justice for those on the margins. This was not at odds with his call to love those who disagreed and plotted to end his life. To act as though justice and equality has been achieved becomes tacit support of a status quo, even when that status quo promotes laws and practices that are in direct contradiction to bringing justice and equality to those who are on the margins. The church has its rightful place in the marketplace of ideas and political order. We must speak for those who have no voice. We must speak kingdom values, and we do this while loving those who despise us and persecute us. Maybe this is a good time as any to pause and define what love in this context means. The Greek word for love in this passage is agape, meaning to desire the highest good for the other, expecting nothing in return. Jesus, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and Nelson Mandela all understood that in the absence of this kind of love, the world is caught in the never-ceasing cycle of reciprocal violence. The life of following Jesus is a tricky tension between speaking truth and becoming militant. Justice is receding in the face of politics that have discarded truth and integrity. We have come face to face with the reality that justice can move backwards. Redistricting and repealing laws that have safeguarded voting rights have once again disenfranchised black voters. Refusing to acknowledge our country's shameful history of racial inequality in jobs and lending reverberates in generational poverty. Young black men are incarcerated for minor crimes while white businessmen serve a few months for million dollar fraud. As more states and schools pass laws that ban honest classroom discussions of our more shameful national history, it ensures that we will ignore or even oppose developing solutions. 
History silenced will be history repeated. At times in the past half century, many US anti-Semitism experts thought this country could be aging out of it, that hostility and prejudice against Jews were fading in part because younger Americans held more accepting views than did older ones. But a survey released just this past Thursday shows how widely held such beliefs are in the United States, including among younger Americans. The research by the Anti-Defamation League includes rare detail about the particular nature of anti-Semitism, how it centers on tropes of Jews as clannish, conspiratorial, and holders of power. This survey shows anti-Semitism in its classical fascist form is emerging again in American society. In recent years, particularly since 9-11, anti-Muslim sentiment has spiked. Although these sentiments manifest themselves in many ways, attacks on mosques directly take aim at religious freedom. There have been over 11,000 anti-Asian incidents reported since the COVID pandemic reached the United States. Women's rights over their bodies are being repealed in many states. And this past week, the Missouri Congress, overwhelmingly male, passed a new dress code for its female members. Democratic State Representative Peter Meredith refused to vote on the amendment, telling his colleagues on the floor, I don't think I'm qualified to say what's appropriate or not appropriate for women. And I think this is a really dangerous road for us all to go down. He went on to say, you all had a conniption fit the last two years when we talked about maybe, maybe wearing masks in a pandemic to keep each other safer. You cried, how dare the government tell us what we have to wear over our face? Well, I know some governments require women to wear things over their face. But here, oh, it's okay because we're just talking about how many layers they have to have over their shoulders. The LGBTQ community has faced growing violence and murder. Meanwhile, there is a growing popularity to erase LGBTQ visibility in schools by silencing teachers to mention the reality of gay relationships. LGBTQ-themed books are being banned from libraries, while librarians who've resisted are fired and some libraries defunded. A couple of months ago, Simon and I were awakened at 1.30 in the morning by pounding on the front door of our retreat center where we live accompanied by loud, vile language. In the morning, we found the word closed etched into our front door and homophobic graffiti written all over the side of Simon's car. The sheriffs refused to categorize it as a hate crime and listed it as vandalism under $400. How do we respond to this? Martin Luther King Day 2023 reminds us that the partisan divisions of today are not so different from the political landscape faced by King in his time. Civil rights activists were derided as anti-American, communist, socialists, and unpatriotic mobs. Rhetoric echoed in contemporary attacks against social activists a political backlash reminiscent of the civil rights era. Dr. King showed us how we respond to the pressing social issues of our day. We respond with truth, light, and love. We must be steadfast in truth. Our national rhetoric has sidestepped truth and integrity. Lies spread through social media at lightning speed but we cannot afford to be discouraged. Dr. King famously said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Jesus said, the truth will set you free. 
we are asked to be dynamic and tangible light in our communities. Jesus bids us to be the light of the world. Dr. King wrote, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. We are reminded in our readings today from Dr. King and the wonderful gospel that the foundation of all human forward movement is love, an active participatory action on behalf of the whole world, love that turns the world upside down and brings about the kingdom of God. I close with the final words of the speech we heard but moments ago. I still believe that we shall overcome. This faith can give us courage to face the uncertainties of the future. It will give our tired feet new strength as we continue our forward stride toward the city of freedom. When our days become dreary with low, hovering clouds, and our nights become darker than a thousand midnights, we will know that we are living in the creative turmoil of a genuine civilization struggling to be born. Amen.
May light unfold within you like the breaking dawn. May the light of Christ be visible in you and give light to the world. And may the light and blessing of God, our creator, redeemer, and giver of life, shine on you and make your days always bright. Amen. Thank you.